I tried to open a can of controversy in the last video, and barely anyone bit on it. And by barely anyone, I really mean one. Only one person took the bait, and you know who you are. A beloved Patreon supporter who is concerned that I may be eaten by sharks in my fishing attempt to only rely on plastic gauge to measure oil clearances in a YouTube video. It's supposed to be a controversial topic, but I got no bites. Oh well, apparently all my viewers are too based and intelligent to do what normally happens to a YouTuber because I got a total reprieve. I'm making this video anyway. This one's short, off format a bit, and it's an unsponsored free production this time around. This video cost me like $6 to make, but I was thinking about all of you guys and wanted to give you something useful while you waited. In the last video, everyone observed main oil clearances measured with plastic gauge that would have worked. I said I wasn't happy with the results because they were short, but I knew there was a whole lot more to it than that. I knew what the numbers were supposed to be already and something wasn't right. This video is going to demonstrate what plastic gauge really does or doesn't do. Is it useful or is it useless? This video is going to make more sense than someone's forum post, Facebook hate, or some buried YouTube comment. If my efforts here should be meaningful at all, then they have to be accurate. Accuracy of measurements is a whole different topic altogether, but for the average person doing this at home, it's simply important to do what's within your power to achieve the best level of accuracy as a baseline that you can. So first I'm going to re-zero both my micrometers and check all my measurements again. Don't worry, I'm just skimming all this. All these parts had some degree of work performed to them since the first time that I took these measurements, so verifying what we've got is part of this example. After checking all the measurements with the crank laying down, I stood the crankshaft up to check the 90s and the 45s, because if there's a bit of run out in one direction or the other, you want to go with the largest measurement that you find on each crank journal, and for obvious reasons. Whether a bit of polishing occurred or temperature changes happened, something affected my measurements by about 10 thousandth here or there on some of the mains. It's an easy fix with a whiteboard. I found this a little bit interesting though after rechecking all the rods because they were all still spot on with my original measurements. I didn't have to change anything, so there you have it. There's the state of my crankshaft for this example. I was going to measure the big ends and the rod clearances, but I changed my mind for several reasons. I've already determined that they were fit for a different crankshaft, so they're not the clearances that I'd use anyway. My machine shop won't care what measurements I take because they'll take their own. Plus, my bore gauge can only measure a hole that's two inches at the minimum, and the big end rod bore is smaller than that, so... So, now to inspect the block again, and more thoroughly this time. I'm taking six measurements on every main bearing journal. Two measurements on opposite sides of the bearing, and at three angles. One 45 degrees from the main cap parting line, one 90 degrees from the main cap parting line, and one 135 degrees from the main cap parting line. I documented every one of them on the whiteboard. Each time I moved to a new journal, I re-zeroed the dial bore gauge to its corresponding measurement of the crankshaft. Happy to save you all that video in an editing. With plastic gauge, you saw me measure roughly two thousandths on every main journal. And I fudged the estimates a little bit doing that, and it, that's a stupid thing to do. Only one came in short for how I'm going to use this engine, and I estimated that one around 1.7 thousandths. But you see here, it's actually measuring in between two and a half and four and a half thousandths clearances with the bore gauge. Why? Why is it that far off? Well, just because you measured all the journals with plastic gauge doesn't mean that that's what your oil clearances actually are. Crankshafts aren't flexible, but plastic gauge isn't going to tell you if your crank is bent or if the bore isn't straight. Guess what? Neither does the bore gauge. It's not going to tell you that either. Neither one of these means of measurement verifies the alignment of your bore centers or the straightness of your crankshaft. Barring access to expensive machinery, it's only the cases when the measurements that you take with the bore gauge and the results from your plastic gauge test don't match that you have an indicator that something is wrong. This is the litmus test for plastic gauge. This is why it's important for assemblers to use it even when it lies, because it will, and you saw it here. Your machinist isn't going to use plastic gauge. You can put that stuff in their Christmas stocking and they won't even know what to do with it. Or with you for that matter. The only truth you'll find in determining your actual oil clearances will come from using micrometers, dial bore gauges, and to a lesser degree, snap gauges. All plastic gauge does is measure the rough estimate of a clearance between the part and the hole however it fits, and only in whatever random spot you place the plastic gauge. Mine came out straight because the crank is straight. The hole was honed straight-ish. The top half of the bore is fine. I actually crushed the oversized bearing shell trying to fit it and correct that oil clearance. 
Even though Plastic Gauge ranks with the accuracy of a visual inspection, it's the only visual inspection that you'll ever do that can estimate measurements of how assembled parts actually fit together. All the other measurements you take separately, and you do the math. If your bearings aren't seating right, or you get results that don't line up with what your actual measurements say it should be, well then there you go. You have a problem to find. Your factory service manual includes the plastic gauge test in your assembly procedure for a reason. And truthfully, their biggest motivation is not to question the machine work. It's to rule out mistakes caused by the assembler. It just so happens that it can actually determine both. We could just end the video here. For the kind of problem that I have, neither method of measurement could have actually determined this all by itself. It would take both methods to do this at home. Let's go through a few more checks though to verify my suspicions. The fastest, laziest, and generally worst way to check the mains for straightness is with the straight edge and feeler gauges. Lay the straight edge down across the mains and see if you can fit the smallest feeler gauge under it. You can do this with or without a bearing girdle, but in my case, I do have a bearing girdle. This will quickly reveal whether your main caps are straight or whether the blocks ever had work done to it before. Quick and dirties are the best kinds of tests to always do first. Non-invasive tests like this or like the plastic gauge example, they can save you a whole lot of time. And just like with the plastic gauge, if you want to actually pinpoint a problem, well, then you got a whole lot more measuring to do, but at least you know where to start. Just check out all this failure going on here, right here. The thickness of this feeler gauge doesn't actually matter because I've got two dissimilar materials here fighting each other. So the problem I'm finding is actually worse than whatever the smallest feeler gauge in my hand is. Just like in the last video where we checked out the bores, stress loads are at play in this example here today. Everything I said in the previous video about stress loads on castings from cylinder heads being vaulted onto them, well, it also applies right here on the mains. This issue that you're witnessing is no reflection on the Kigley bearing girdle at all. This is a dynamite product and it's actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do. The material it's made from is far more rigid than a porous cast iron block. Right here, you're seeing a problem with the block, not the girdle. Kigley has a very specific requirement for installation of this part, and you can see that my block does not meet that specification at all. You can be off by as much as well, a couple of thousandths, it says, so long as it's honed before and with the bearing girdle installed before it's put back into use. And we thought this here was where we were already, but clearly someone else had already been in here before us because we shaved off was nowhere close to being bad enough to cause all of this. We took a couple of thousandths off all of them, but we squared the cut with the flange surface prior to cutting, not from the back of the caps. That's not going to correct main cap heights if they're already out of square, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I should have been more specific when I dropped this off. If you want to see the precision version of this kind of test, you just use micrometers to measure each and every bolt flange on the caps, methodically checking the entire face of both the high and the low spots. A flange that's not flat will pull the hole out of round once it's torqued. It takes a lot of time and patience to do this, but it's an easy, straightforward process. The low measurement will help you determine at what height to cut the caps, and the high measurement will give you a comparison to find any runout. It takes about an hour to measure all of this and document it. I'll spare you all the gory details with some more warp speed, and well, there you go. You have all the numbers. I had runout on every cap. You might recall when Stuart and I shaved the very first cap that it wasn't straight right to start with. We made a pass of a couple thousandths and we'll see that we've got a nice clean surface. We've got a little bit of workage on one corner. And there we go. We had to cut it twice. Let's take a better look at these numbers and see what's really going on here. You can see one through five mapped out. I've got my high spot and my low spot. The run out on the face of each leg of each main cap is less significant to me than the variation in the cap heights overall because that's what's fighting with the bearing girdle and causing most of my headaches. Looking at the bore, there's variation in the X, Y, and Z measurements showing how stress loads pulling on the uneven caps that were sandwiched between the girdle and the block made the holes drift. You can pause it if you want to microanalyze this, but I'll get straight to the point for the people who find themselves trying to put a bearing girdle into a block that has uneven main cap heights. The problem revealed by these numbers is something that a machinist is capable of correcting, and the process is called a cap height reset. It's fairly invasive because it includes boring as well as honing, 
but it's what I've requested for a solution because of the power levels that I hope to achieve with this hole. My hole has to be perfect. If the main cap flanges in the block are all straight, and you've verified this with a straight edge and your smallest feeler gauge, and then you do all that measuring stuff to the main caps and find that it's within two thousandths, well then follow Kigley's instructions and you're going to be just fine. But if the main caps vary by much more than that, it's likely going to give you a whole lot of problems unless you do a cap height reset. We'll talk more about that process later. The point of this video is supposed to be about plastic gauge and whether or not it's useless. More than its suspicious packaging and its methodology of use, my example proves that it's impossible for plastic gauge to give you an actual measurement for your oil clearances. We all just busted plastic gauge lying, and I thought that this is a useful example that the internet needed. These precision measurements, along with a set of feeler gauges, just told you how and why it lied. But even when everything fits perfectly, the measurement that you get is still just your own fudged estimate based on the width of a stripe that's printed on a poorly graduated piece of paper. So you're still guessing. But what should anyone ever expect from it when they only spent a half a penny for every dollar's worth of accuracy that they're looking for? What value does a $5 test in an hour of your time have if you're spending thousands of dollars building an engine? I'll leave that up to all of you to decide. I really don't think there's anything more I can add to this. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this example. If I've missed anything or you just want to say hi, please leave it in the comments below. Hit that like button while you're at it so that other smart people like you get to see this. And I'm still going to thank my Patreon supporters. I explained to all of them why this video is not sponsored. Not this time, sorry. If you want to read more about that conversation, well, you can do it for as little as a dollar per video. And the link to that is in the prescription. I'll be back with a normal length episode soon, so until then, stay tubed.